Smartphone history is peppered with many examples of milestone features, whether it's the iPhone's zoom camera, the Pixel 3's night sight, or more recently super smooth 120Hz screens. But for every big selling new phone feature, there are dozens of examples of dead end tech that eventually, for whatever reason, just didn't work out. And we're going to take a look at a handful of the worst of those today. So take a sec to subscribe to XDA TV and we'll jump into our picks for the worst abandoned smartphone tech that deserves its place in the flaming dumpster of history. was the next big thing, until suddenly it wasn't. Back in the early 2010s, there was a big push behind 3D in cinemas, TV, gaming, and eventually phones. The two big 3D equipped Android phones were the HTC Evo 3D and the LG Optimus 3D. Both featured 4.3 inch 3D capable panels on the front and twin cameras for capturing 3D photos and even video around back. For as primitive as these were, and especially considering these were first gen products, the 3D effect still holds up pretty well today. Wow, it's so realistic in 3D. The effect works within a limited distance, and you need to be right in front of the phone to see it. That's because the stereoscopic effect works by splitting the resolution and showing a different set of pixels to each of your eyes. That was just the first of many compromises with 3D phones like this though. The brightness was also lower in 3D mode and the distance between the twin lenses necessitated some seriously chonky camera bulges. The real problem though was the dearth of decent 3D content. Sure, you could watch big budget movies in 3D, but you wouldn't want to do that for long on a 4.3 inch display. Gaming options were limited. Plus, while YouTube did, and last time I checked, still does support stereoscopic content, creators just weren't uploading 3D videos. Doing so was expensive and complicated, especially back then. It was a bit easier if you shot on a 3D phone like one of these, but if you did, then the quality was usually garbage anyway. So yeah, you were mostly left having to shoot your own 3D content to watch on the 3D display in your pocket. Obviously with the state of phone cameras 11 years ago, the results were less than spectacular. The problems with the broader 3D ecosystem, some configurations making people feel sick, poor uptake of 3D TVs, meant that the 3D content creation and consumption device was always going to be a hard sell. It was your classic chicken and egg problem. Without the content, consumer buying was always going to be lukewarm, but without the install base of 3D TVs, phones and other displays, there was little incentive to the people making that content. 3D displays made a brief, disappointing and expensive comeback with the Red Hydrogen 1 in 2018, a train wreck of a product that failed as both a phone and a camera, and is now more famous for being that random phone that kept appearing in 2021's Netflix movie Don't Look Up. Otherwise, 2011 was the end of the road for 3D phones, and a few years later it was generally accepted that the 3D TV as a product category had also failed. Wouldn't it be great if you could upgrade your phone piece by piece, just like a PC? It was a noble goal, and a few brands tried really hard to make it happen, but ultimately the modular phone concept never really worked out and is now dead. One of the earliest efforts in modular phones was Google's project Ara in 2011, a modular phone with three frame sizes that can plug into Snap and modules, also in three sizes. You'd be able to plug in mods for cameras, speakers, and other add-ons, and modules would be hot swappable without rebooting the core phone. Google even imagined that accessories like mini projectors and receipt printers might be possible with this setup, the dream of a more flexible smartphone that could easily switch between roles. But between delays to the ultimately aborted Puerto Rico market pilot, Aura ultimately failed to prove the viability of this kind of form factor. Aura devices ended up being heavier, bulkier, and less efficient than a traditional purpose-built smartphone. The smaller you go, the less power you use, the harder it is to keep that modularity and upgradability. Kind of the same reasons most laptops these days aren't upgradable versus, say, a full-size desktop PC. There were a couple of other contenders, though. In 2016, LG's G5 was a big bet on building an ecosystem of LG friends that could plug into the bottom of the phone. Modules replaced the lower portion of the device where the removable battery was housed, and they included initially a hi-fi module and a camera grip. This system was arguably the worst of the bunch, clunky, requiring a reboot when changing modules, and the modules themselves were pretty lackluster, made worse by some versions of these modules being incompatible with certain carrier's versions of the G5. No surprise, LG made a hard pivot away from modules with the G6 in the following year. Motorola had a better time with its Moto Z, which is probably the most commercially successful modular phone system. It stuck by its ecosystem of Moto mods for four generations between 2016 and 2019, and the modular experience was pretty seamless, attaching with a magnetic snap. And in researching these mods for this video, I was surprised to see how many there actually were, not just the usual things like camera attachments, kickstands, and bigger batteries, but smart speakers, full gaming controllers, and even a Polaroid branded printer. 
But most Moto Mods were expensive, and the way they attached meant the Moto had to stick with that same footprint of the original Moto Z if it wanted to keep the ecosystem alive. As such, Moto Mods were quietly unlisted from Moto's website in mid-2020. Today, most flagship phones have some sort of telephoto capability, and even digital zoom is good enough that you could punch in it two or three times and your shots will probably look pretty good. But for a brief time in the mid-2010s, Samsung tried to solve this problem a different way. The Galaxy S4 Zoom, released in 2013, was half smartphone, half point-and-shoot camera. It was an offshoot of 2012's Galaxy Camera, which literally was a point-and-shoot camera that ran Android. The Galaxy S4 Zoom was a bit more compact than that device, though still fairly bulky for a phone, and included important phone stuff like the ability to make phone calls. The S4 Zoom packed a larger camera sensor for the time, a 1 over 2.33 inch 16 megapixel shooter, and its main party trick was true smooth optical zoom up to 10 times. And for the time, it actually wasn't horrible to use, the main pain point being the aforementioned bulk. This thing was pretty chunktastic, and I remember it being a real hassle to fit into a jeans pocket. Plus, the lens and moving parts meant that it was potentially a lot more breakable than a regular phone if you dropped it. The level of zoom on offer was impressive for the time, though the photo quality was held back by 2013-era image processing and the relatively small aperture of f1.6 at the max zoom level. That makes it pretty much useless in low light. Samsung stuck with the concept into 2014 with the Galaxy K Zoom, a slightly upgraded variant based on Galaxy S5 internals. In the end though, smartphone photography evolved in the direction of multiple larger sensors and lenses with a fixed focal length, as opposed to the point-and-shoot style zoom with all the moving parts and complexity that that involved. But Samsung actually wasn't the only company crazy enough to put a moving zoom lens inside a smartphone. Early 2015 brought us the Asus Zenfone Zoom, an Intel Atom-powered smartphone with an internal telephoto inside a periscope configuration. So the same concept as periscope telephoto in phones today, only with moving parts. This was different to the S4 Zoom in that it didn't have a telephoto lens that protruded out the back, all the moving parts were internal. The phone arrived to mixed reviews in mid-2015, mainly relating to Asus's software as opposed to the actual photo quality. Once again, we have an abandoned feature here that relates to moving parts and extra bulk. Super Zoom Telephoto just wasn't a huge draw for buyers in 2013 with all the compromises involved, and we'd have to wait until 2021 for the Galaxy S21 Ultra to get true telephoto zoom at 10 times in a Samsung phone. Virtual reality itself, of course, is far from a dead technology, but VR in phones has been basically defunct since around 2019. It started promisingly in 2014 with Google Cardboard offering a cheap, simple way to turn any smartphone into a rudimentary virtual reality device. VR needs a small, high-res display, and the smallest, most pixel-dense screen most people have is in their phone. So why not strap it into a cardboard headset and enjoy the basics of what VR can offer? Soon after, Samsung launched its Gear VR platform, a more competitive, more plasticky VR product that you could plug your Galaxy phone into and strap to your face. Then Google's Daydream brought similar capabilities to more of the Android ecosystem. Unlike a dedicated headset, there was no need for a display on SoC. The headset just needed to fit your phone of choice and include the right lenses for an immersive stereoscopic effect. VR on phones began with some big pushes from the major platform holders, but ultimately fizzled, as more people chose increasingly cheap standalone headsets that were actually designed with VR in mind, in addition naturally to more expensive higher-end console and PC options. From speaking to one industry insider, the problem with smartphone VR basically came from trying to shoehorn one product, your phone, into a role it wasn't really suited for. Running a VR experience is taxing on your phone's processor and battery, running at full tilt for however long you're viewing or playing. That's in stark contrast to what your phone, its battery, and its processor is designed to be doing most of the time, which is idling, maybe pulling down notifications, and sipping power as it does. Running VR on this kind of device also required a lot of optimization in the software, which wasn't a huge priority for a lot of phone makers, and it was a big barrier to adoption even with Google pushing hard for OEMs to get on board with Daydream. So VR on phones? It can be done, and you can still buy that original cardboard headset today, but VR quickly outgrew the smartphone, and a modern VR experience is much better enjoyed on a dedicated headset like a Quest or a Vive. That's it for now, hit the comments, let us know which of these you remember and whether you agree or disagree that they died a deserved death. Be sure to subscribe to XDA TV for more like this, along with the usual reviews and all that good stuff. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.